Audi Central. We're almost done with Route 66. We have been taking a look at every book of the Bible week by week, and today we are in 3rd John. One y'all have studied every day for most of your lives, right? 3rd John. If you're not sure where 3rd John is, go to the maps and start going backwards till you get to the third from the last book. Next week is Jude, and you don't want to miss Jude. Jude is remarkable and rich and deep. And then there's a little book called Revelation we're going to round it all out with. And I will tell you about that day. That's the 30th. You want to be here for the music on that day. It's going to be something really, really special. And so that'll be a great day. Just to let you know what's going on after that is after that, I'm going to preach a short series called Objection, where I'm going to take five Sundays to address common objections that I know you have heard toward the Christian faith. And we're going to see how the Bible answers those objections because I want you to be able to hear those when somebody makes a claim such as, well, why should I believe the Bible? It was written hundreds of years after the time of Christ. When you can respond and say, actually, that's not true. And you have some real evidence to back up your claims. Then after that short series called Objection, we will have a not short series called Genesis. That is going to be in the book of Genesis. So we will go all the way through Genesis, and I'm looking forward to going through that book with you. We are in 3 John today, which if you've read 3 John this week, you might have wondered, why do I need to understand 3 John? Why did God preserve this little letter that seems so irrelevant to our times for me? And I hope to help everyone see that today. But I'll begin with a question. Why are you here? Why are you here today? And I think there would be a lot of answers if we were just to go around the room and if everybody were to be real honest about why they're here. I mean, some people might say, well, I have to be here. My parents made me come. My wife made me come. I'm here to make my dad happy for Father's Day. There could be a lot of reasons. It could be that, well, you're here out of an obligation or a sense of duty. Maybe you had to serve in the church this morning. Maybe you had to stand at a door and greet people as they came. As Well, I got to get up and go because they're counting on me to be there. Maybe there's that duty or obligation, or maybe you're here because you just love church. Maybe you're one of those people, you just count the days between Sundays. And you can't wait to get back to church because you love everything about it. Maybe there are certain things you love. But maybe you're here because you just love to sing with your church family. I know a lot of people like that. They just, you just can't wait till the music starts. And then there are probably some of you who can't wait till the music's over because your favorite part's the preaching. <laughs> but you would never tell John that. Maybe you just, you're here because you love the community. And I tell you, I love all those things about church. I love the music. Man, the songs we just sang, were those not Christ-exalting? Did those not minister to your soul? The word we're about to look at should feed our souls. And the community of the faith, I was actually sitting out there, and I know, I, one of the reasons Terry says she sits up front because she's so easily distracted. And I can be that way too. And I was getting distracted by the choir, because I kept looking up at the choir, and I would go, oh, I love him, I love her, I love him, I love her. And I just got to look at it, and I thought, I love every person sitting up there. They just were family, and it's so good to be together. And so, you know, there could be lots of reasons. There are a lot of good reasons to be here. But have you ever thought of this question? Why is the church here? Have you ever thought about that? Why, why are we here today? Well, Jesus tells us why we're here. In the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, when he gave the commission to the disciples, but it was a timeless, it wasn't just for them, it was a timeless mission for all his followers until he returns, where he says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. The church is here because the church has a mission, and that mission's not even fuzzy, it is clear. And when you become a Christian, God brings you into a community that has so many wonderful blessings, the community of faith, the singing we get to do, the, the ministry we get to do together. But there's something else. When we come into this community, we find that we have 
a purpose larger than ourselves, don't we? When we become Christians, we become part of something bigger, something that transcends everything else in this world. And the church only functions properly if we in the church understand this well. Well, 3 John is a letter written by the Apostle John to a guy named Gaius. It's a small letter, 15 verses. It's not comprehensive, but it does speak to the mission we're a part of. And in the letter, we're going to meet two men, two men who are a part of this local church. And one of those men is all about the mission. And one of those men is all about himself. Let's read this letter and take a look at it. Beginning in verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it's a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, for they've gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God, and whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write you. But I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends each by name. So the first man we look at here is this man named Gaius, and he shows us how some people understand the mission. We don't know who Gaius is. He's a guy in this church, perhaps a leader in the church, probably a leader in the church, but not necessarily a pastor, but he's just he's a member of the church that gets this letter. Now, I want to say just a quick word about this greeting, just because you may hear these words come up from time to time. In the greeting, he, he says to him that he prays that all would go well with him and he'd be in good health as it goes well with his soul. I don't know if you guys remember Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. Y'all remember them from the 80s, the televangelists? They had the 700, not, was it the 700 club they had? No. So they had some show, and you remember she was always crying and had the purple hair, and he lost his ministry because of his dalliance with his secretary, and then he went to prison for embezzling something like $150 million, wire fraud and all that stuff. So he went to prison, served five years in prison, got out of prison. Now he's back on TV. Do you all know that? He's back on TV, and now he's not only making prophecies, but he is selling um, Prepper kits, basically, for the, for, I don't know, for the zombie apocalypse or something, I guess. I don't know. But you can buy food kits, like for $125 up, that have a shelf life of 30 years. But he's back to preaching this message that if you're walking faithfully with the Lord, you will never get sick and you'll always be rich. And this is one of the verses. This is one of the prime verses he claims for that. A greeting that this guy would have good health and that things would go well. In. That's what we talk about taking a verse out of context. That's what we talk about twisting Scripture to your own ends. That's what he's doing. Because I want you to think just common sense here. He's talking to Gaius about a man walking faithfully with the Lord. Well, if he's walking faithfully in the Lord, why did he need to pray for his health? See, here's this message that if you're walking faithfully with the Lord, you'll never get sick. You know what he's doing here? He's, uh, he's just praying that he'll be healthy. 
There's no guarantee if you're walking with Jesus, you're going to be healthy or that you're going to be rich. But there's also nothing wrong with praying for your sick friends and praying for the general well-being of other people. So Gaius, let's get back to Gaius. I just wanted to get that out of the way in case you'd ever heard any of that kind of nonsense coming from, from that. It's a good example for us to see. But Gaius, the key to his understanding the mission was that he was walking in the truth. And I love when John says, you know, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And, and, and this is not his literal son. This, is, this would have been somebody that, that he had maybe led to the Lord or mentored somebody. He had been his spiritual father in the Lord, if you're well. And he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are working, walking in the truth. Isn't that the truth, y'all? I mean, when there's somebody that you have shared the gospel with that has come to faith in Christ, And maybe you lose touch with them, and then you hear that they're very faithfully serving the Lord 10, 15, 20 years later. There's nothing better than that, is there? I mean, it's great. Or somebody that maybe you spent a lot of time just giving a lot of your life and mentoring and and helping them grow in their faith. And and then later you see that they're still walking faithfully in the Lord, and they're sharing the gospel, and they're doing these things. It's It's so great. It's so exciting. But unfortunately, not everybody is that way. Sometimes we see people that, you know, we went to the Lord. In fact, I love what uh, Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher, Baptist preacher of the 19th century, said that a, a drunk approached him on the street one time and said, why, Mr. Spurgeon, I'm one of your converts. And he said, well, you must be one of my converts because you're not one of the Lord's. But isn't that disheartening when you, when you think you're helping somebody come to the Lord and you find that they just walk away? Unfortunately, it happens to a lot of people. But Gaius, Gaius was walking in the truth. And one result of that is that he was supporting missionaries. Now, let's look again at verses 5 through 8. He says, Beloved, it's a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they've gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers in the truth. Now, you might remember from 2 John. 2 John dealt with a different issue, but this, it, they, had a, they had a commonality here talking about hospitality for itinerant preachers, missionaries who were traveling. Now, the problem in 2 John is that people were welcoming false teachers who were traveling into their home. And you say, you might, you know, you say, well, aren't we supposed to be nice to everybody and show hospitality to everybody? Yes. But in this context, what's going on is to bring a teacher into your home was to also give them a platform to preach a false doctrine in your church, to give them that kind of support. So they were supporting these false teachers. And what's going on here is just the opposite. He's talking about a report he had gotten from some of these itinerant preachers, some of these missionaries that, hey, when we were in this town, That guy, Gaius, took us in. He helped us. He introduced us to other people. He endorsed our ministry. He gave us a platform. He took care of us, and he sent us on our way. So Gaius is actually doing the right thing here. In fact, we see see here that there's a guy named Demetrius mentioned in verse 12 who was likely the courier. He was probably the one that delivered this letter from John. Is that agreement, Lord? I don't think y'all appreciate how intimidating thunder is when you're preaching. (laughs) I don't know if he's happy or mad. (laughs) But I continue. (laughs) Verse 12, Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself we also add our testimony. So what he's saying is, look, I sent this guy Demetrius to you, and I'm giving him my endorsement. Everyone speaks well of this guy, and he has my seal of approval, basically for you now to take him into your home and show him that hospitality. This is Gaius' ministry. Now, we don't have the same system really, do we, where missionaries need to come and stay in our homes because they're going all around America sharing the gospel and like that. We, we don't live in the same context, but we do have ways that we are to support missionaries. Most of you know that last week, Terry and I weren't here because we were on our way to the Southern Baptist Convention in Birmingham. And we got to Dallas, and there was a major storm come through Dallas that just 
pretty much killed the computer systems at Dallas Love Field. And uh, I got a text that says, your flight has been canceled. Call this number. So I called the number, and they said, uh, yeah, we can get you there Tuesday afternoon. But we're getting your bag there right now. So our suitcase got to go to Birmingham. And we got to, well, we actually spent the night, Sunday night, because they said, yeah, your bag will be back here at 8.20 in the morning. <laughs> no. Terry got to drive back to Dallas on Tuesday to go get our bag. But the point of all that, we didn't get to go to convention. And, you know, I, I don't know, I've, I've fielded some questions by people asking me, you know, hey, what's going on? What happened with the Southern Baptist Convention? Because you read all kinds of things in the news. Don't believe stuff you see on social media. One of the things I love, and let me just say this, I do not believe the Southern Baptist Convention is the only good denomination. I also believe the Southern Baptist Convention is far from perfect, but I am one happy Southern Baptist. We are Bible-believing, Christ-exalting, missionary-sending people, and the way that we send missionaries is through what we call the cooperative program. Do you know that 10% of every dollar you give to Central Baptist Church goes to our cooperative program. And our cooperative program is sending missionaries all over the world, all over North America, funding ministries that we could never touch alone as a church. So that's one of the things we do. So when you are being faithful in giving, that's what you're doing. We have that really fun dessert auction and you're giving, that's, that's what you're doing. You're, that's why we encourage giving here. It's not about money. I'm not Jim Baker. I don't drive the kind of car he drives, and I don't own any kind of airplane. That's not what we do with our money. When we encourage you to give, you know why we want you to give? For the gospel. For the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the Great Commission. For the sake of reaching all the nations. And this becomes our role in supporting missionaries. Not so much, here's our house and here's our food, but here is our monetary support. Well, Gaius was a man who knew the Word. He lived the Word. He walked with the Lord. And Paul calls him in verse 8 a fellow worker. Now, that's interesting. He calls him a fellow worker even though he's not on the mission field. I mean, John calls him that. He's not on the mission field with John. He's not on the mission field with um, Demetrius. So how is he a fellow worker? Well, here's the deal. Not everybody is called to be a missionary, though some are. In fact, I want to have the attention, I want to have the ear right now of all the children and students in the room. Because I am praying that from you, God is going to be raising up people who will go to the nations. And I have no doubt there's probably some in here, even at young ages, beginning to feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit. God's giving you a burden. I'm praying that during Vacation Bible School next week, God is going to identify future missionaries who will go to the foreign mission field. But it's not only the children, adults, listen to this. When I first went to seminary, I, I, was, I went to seminary, how old was I? I was 92. I was 27. I thought I was going to be the oldest guy there because I thought everybody was coming right out of college and I'd already had a career. And that wasn't the case. I went to seminary with a guy who left his medical practice so that he could get theologically educated so he could go to the mission field. I went to seminary with two retired Air Force pilots who were going to seminary to be appointed as full... Well, one of them actually became a pastor. One of them became a full-time missionary. And I wonder if there are people in this room where you're thinking, oh, well, I'm set in my ways and I'm stuck in my career that God wouldn't be laying it on your heart even now. You know you're supposed to be going to the nations and you just need to get out there and do it. Is it hard? Yep. But some people God calls to do that. And I wonder if there's anybody in the room that God is calling like that. Some are called, but not everyone is. In fact, most are not. But every single Christian is called to the mission, which is the Great Commission. Some are called to leave home, but all are called wherever we all are. And all of us are called to support missions. All of us are called to give to the mission endeavors. All of us are called to pray for our missionaries. Our mission, our purpose for existence as a church, existence as a church is to make disciples of all nations. 
And the truth is, we won't be very effective if every single one of us doesn't understand that and doesn't participate fully in it. So some do understand the mission. And I love that as I'm looking around the room, I know there are a lot of people in this room that really get it. And you are doing it. But some people don't. Some people understand the mission and some people don't. And this is when we come to Diotrephes in verses 9 and 10. It says, I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I'll bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. Not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Simply put, Diotrephes was a troublemaker. It was all about Diotrephes. For one thing, he rejected authority. Here is John with spiritual authority, and even the leaders in that church with spiritual authority, and he didn't care what they had to say. He completely rejected authority. I was in a church like that one time. They had had a bad history. They'd had some really bad experiences with some pastors, so they came to the mindset, mindset all pastors are bad. And therefore, I was constantly reminded, listen, you're nothing but an employee. We can fire you whenever we want to. You will do what we tell you to do. You need to understand your place. Oh, man, can you imagine what a happy church that is to pastor? Can you imagine what a happy church that is to go to? It was difficult because those in leadership have to be able to provide leadership even if you don't always agree. Now, people always say, but yeah, but what if it is a bad pastor? There's, that's that reality. And so I would say to you, if you ever catch me doing anything illegal, unethical, immoral, or teaching anything unbiblical, deal with me strongly. And can I also say, Central, y'all are awesome to me. And do you know that Central has a reputation for treating its pastors well? Do y'all know that? Before I came here, that's something I learned about Central. By the way, before I went to that other church, I was told, don't go there, they will kill you. <laughs> and I was told about Central, those people are wonderful, they will love you. And you have proven that to be true. By the way, when I'm talking about diatrophies, I'm not thinking about anybody in the room, y'all. You need to know that. Terry and I feel like we're in a really sweet place, and we are blessed, but it's important to understand this. So here's this guy, troublemaker. He rejected authority. He even slandered people. He was talking wicked nonsense, John says. You ever had that happen to you? I have. I've had people just spread lies in rumors. I shared, I shared that before with you. I don't want to go into that. But people like diatrophies aren't concerned with the truth because they have a personal agenda. So what we read about him Here's Gaius who's taking in the missionaries and treating them well, but Diotrephes says, nope, we're not going to take that guy, we're not going to take that guy, we're not going to take that guy. He is the one setting the standard based on his agenda, and in fact, if somebody does give them support, I'm going to run them out of the church. We call those bullies. You ever seen bullies in church? Man, I have. One of the biggest bullies Terry and I ever dealt with was a woman in the church one time, and man, she was just mean. I mean, just mean. Said mean things, spread false rumors, ran people off. Oh, that's terrible. I was thinking about one guy who was such a bully. You know what he did to bully? He used his money to bully. You don't do what I say, I'm not giving. And I give a lot. I'll cripple this church. Wow! How ungodly is that kind of attitude? Diotrephes was not interested in the mission of the church, and John called him out. And I love this. John's basically saying, he says, look, if I come, I'll deal with him. What he's saying is I'm giving you the opportunity to deal with it, church. Because this is one problem churches have is they won't stand up to bullies, will they? I was in that one church that was really difficult, and I had, I had a deacon sit down with me one time. He says, man, I hope they don't fire you. He says, I'm so tired of seeing us fire preachers. And I, he says, the whole church is sick of it. I said, well, why hadn't you stood up to these bullies? He says, we don't want to make waves. 
the boat's rocking and taking on water, and they don't want to make waves. By the way, no preacher wants to talk about this stuff from the pulpit. But I will say that a church unwilling to protect the unity and the mission is a church that's in trouble. We have a mission, and that mission is to get the gospel to every place on the planet. We believe that every human being needs to hear that Jesus Christ was sent from God, born of a virgin, kept the law perfectly, that Jesus Christ died as our perfect substitute, bearing the full brunt of the wrath of God that we have earned, that we have deserved, that they killed Him, put Him in a tomb, and that three days later He rose from the grave because death cannot contain Him. And we believe that now He sits on the right hand of the Father on high and that everyone who places their faith in Him, everyone will be made right with God and will be with Him forever. But can I tell you, we need to get the gospel out, but our mission is to make disciples. Step one is getting the gospel out. Then we have a long, long hall of making disciples. This is important and it has eternal consequences. We have to be fellow workers together with our missionaries, with other people out there spreading the gospel. We have to, and that means none of us, me either, none of us can have personal agendas. We have to work together. Our mission's too urgent, friends. It's too critical to have people sitting on the sidelines Because when you come to Jesus, you're embracing Him and you embrace His mission. Some people understand the mission. Some people don't. So our takeaway is simply this question, which one are you? Regardless of why you walked in the door today, do you understand why we're here? Do you understand why Central is here? Do you understand what our purpose for existence is? Do you understand that it takes every one of us I've been in this ministry for a long time now, and I have come to see that just like John was dealing with here, some people are on board with the mission that Jesus has given us. And some people simply aren't. So the question is, which one are you? Which one are you? Let's pray. Holy Father, this uh, little letter is such an encouragement and a caution to us. An encouragement to be all about the mission, to support the mission, to be a fellow worker, a team player in the mission, and to put to death all our personal agendas. Because we can all get them, Father. We all are prone to selfishness and self-interest. I thank you for a church that is... uh, serious about reaching the nations and has shown that with missionary support and generosity. Thank you for a church that is good to its leaders. And Father, I pray that we would be a church where every single one of us is all in on our mission. Let it be said of us that we understand why we're here that we understand what we need to be doing and that we are all a part of making it happen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.